Good evening, and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we're on the road to Town Meeting Day 2020. And this is an unusual year because we have a district, District 3, where we have two seats up. When Ashley Hill resigned, we have a one-year term uh, that has a candidate, and we have three candidates for the two-year term of replacing Glenn Hutchinson, who decided that he wasn't going to run again. Uh, in District 2, we have Connor Casey running unopposed. In District 1, we have Donna Bate running unopposed. And we actually have a great show where we put the two of them together. And that's a, a two-parter that's about a half an hour apiece, well worth watching. And uh, we also have Ann Watson explaining why we should re-elect her mayor again, running against no one. You can see a trend going. And, and that's a good show, too. Uh, and we have our school board candidates who are all going to be elected in the same trend you can see. And then we have an excellent show uh, with Bill Fraser talking about the city budget. And Libby is going to discuss the school budget. Both of those are excellent shows as well. And tonight we are in the school district in one of the three-year terms with Jill Remick, who's come to visit us. Jill, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Why in the world are you running for the board? <laughs> so um, I am a very proud resident of Montpelier. I have been for 15 years. I grew up in St. Johnsbury. Um, I do have a daughter in the system, but I am actually running um, despite that, not because of it. Because, um, what do you I, mean? Well, I would still like to be able to participate as a parent, and so that's why I've been hesitant to, to step up and, and run for the board in the past. Um, but she's getting older and um, I... She's getting older? What grade is she in? She's in sixth grade. Trust me, that's not old. <laughs> and um, so I have several years of experience. Um, I worked for a long time as the policy and legislative affairs director at the Agency of Education. And then most recently now I'm at the tax department in the property tax division. So I kind of have a unique perspective in that I can actually understand how the very complex machinations that take you from when you vote on a school budget to what your tax rate ends up being and what shows up on your property tax bill. Um, and also a pretty good handle on education policy and the things that Montpelier is doing well and the things that we want to work on. Um, and so I was encouraged to run by a few folks and I thought I'm running out of reasons to say no and I would, I would like to offer Are my services. Are you aware of the time commitment? Yes, that's why I was a little hesitant. Um, definitely depending on which board member you talk to, it's a pretty major time commitment. It's true. Um, I, I like to read a lot, and I know that it's going to cut back on the number of books I'm going to get to read this year, but um, I, I do think the more that I've, now that I've put myself out there and I've been talking to folks about it, I'm actually pretty excited about it because I do think I have something of value to offer the board and the community. When did you move to Montpelier? Um, in 2003. Um, I graduated from Linden State College and then I worked at the Times Argus for a few years and lived in Northfield and then my husband and I bought our house and we've been there ever since. So you were working on Main Street in the, in the Times Argus, yes? Yes, yep, yep. So we Where now we have Shippy. Yeah. <laughs> what was Montpelier like growing up in St. Johnsbury? Did you go to the Academy? I went to St. Johnsbury Academy, yep, which was outstanding. Um, Montpelier was the place that you'd come to get your driver's test, and it felt very big and funky and fun. I remember there was a burrito cart when I got my driver's permit, and that was like a really exciting day for me that I actually parallel parked in the big city of Montpelier and got a burrito from a cart. Um, so it was always, you know... It, Did but, you try and become a page? Uh, no, I had two friends that, that, that were, though. They were pretty excited about that. We'd like to host somebody someday. Um, yeah, so raising a child in Montpelier versus how I grew up in rural St. J is very different. Um, well, I'm taking you to what was the perception of Montpelier High School from the academy? Or didn't you even think of it? Didn't even think about it, honestly. There was no sports interaction or anything? St. Johnsbury was a pretty big high school and had pretty big rivalry, obviously, with Linden Institute. And so, um, and I was not, uh, I didn't play sports in high school. So I wasn't quite as, you know, we'd go and cheer them on, but we were always playing bigger schools um, than Montpelier. Now, if I'm doing my math correctly, <laughs> in 2003 when you moved here, you did not have a child. Correct. <laughs> what was the school, what was your perception of the school not having a child in it? 
So if you could remember back to you right. and your husband, Jesse, when you didn't have a child in the school, what your perception of the Montpelier School District was? Um, I think definitely. You were young parents to be. Yes, and we, um, we, you know, we ended up in our house in downtown Montpelier, which was not necessarily what we were originally, you know, working towards. And it's been an absolute surprise, blessing in every way to raise a kid here. Um, I think honestly, coming in from the outside as someone who was just a property owner, I, um, I was and and continue to some extent to wonder about. Um, you know, the U32 Montpelier merger and, and why that wasn't happening. And, and you know, I would go to like my um, brother-in-law's games at U32 and saw this big school and couldn't figure out why Montpelier and U32 weren't one. Um, now that I'm here and I have a child going through the system and she can walk easily to all three schools, it's pretty great. Um, but I still want to make sure that there's a great deal of rigor, especially at the high school level, because um, what we got at St. John's Free Academy was such a unique experience. You know, we had students from all over the world. We had every possible AP course, every possible sport, music, art, drama. Let me, let me walk you through the merger. If we were to do extensive repairs to, to Main Street Middle School, we'd essentially be closing the door forever to the notion of merging with U32 mm -hmm. and picking up a critical mass of students at one of the two high school or one of the two schools mm -hmm. in order to offer more AP classes, more art classes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's inevitable that the merger will never happen? Gosh, I would not even dare to estimate. Um, I have to do a lot more research about what the plan is for the middle school. The building is definitely um, older. older and it's tight. They don't have room to do the things that they need to do there. and. Um, and that's such a tough age, that's such a critical age for students um, that it would be great if there was, you know, more outdoor space and if the busing could be easier. You know, there's definitely factors to that, but um, but there's more than one way to figure it out. And I, I don't know that you could ever say, never say never about merging or closing buildings or thinking about using the space differently. I think there's lots of options on the table, but that's a, that's a good point that if we really invest in it, then that's a commitment for the immediate future. For uh, we've sure. been on a, a very slow growth curve in, in the schools. On the margin, we're picking up students. Mm -hmm. um, but we're never projected to have the kinds of student body that we had when you came here mm -hmm. or, or the decade before. Right. Uh, is the high school sustainable? Um, I think it is, but we definitely lose a significant number of families and students as kids get older because as families want to buy a home or move into a bigger apartment or something like that, they do not have those options in Montpelier. If we were coming to Montpelier now, I don't think there would be a house we could afford to buy in Montpelier. So we have to actually think about, the, they're not, they're not um, in isolation, those two problems. So, you know, when my daughter was in kindergarten, those classes were overflowing with kids of all different backgrounds and kids from all different socioeconomic status. And as they get older, the families that are choosing to buy a home or want to, you know, move into commit somewhere cannot afford to stay in Montpelier and they're moving out. So I feel like I want to be a part of kind of continuing that conversation about how to support more housing for families and everybody so that we can keep those kids for the long term because the, it, the, the numbers dwindle at high school pretty significantly. Then you have the people my age and my wife's age mm -hmm. and who's going to replace us. Mm -hmm. You know, will we be replaced by young families? Right. Um, right now what I see in the real estate market in Montpelier is, um, is it's really, really hard for two working parents with kids, or not with kids, but two working individuals to be able to afford a house. There's, there's very few houses that are within the price range of what a Vermont salary or two Vermont salaries are. Um, so we really need to broaden our tax base a little bit. In what happens to our subsidized lunch people who are <laughs> renters? Right, right. The mo well, the more people we get in here, the broader the base. You know, we have more, we'll have more taxpayers will have a little bit more of a property tax base. You know, Montpelier is so, um, for the number of actual residents like you and I who live in a home and we pay our property taxes versus the amount of services and 
um, supports that a city this size needs, it's not equitable. We have so many state buildings, we have so, so many... So we're on to, could you explain what the pilot is about? Sure, so pilot is the payment... What does of, it stand for? Yeah, it's the payment in lieu of taxes um, that the state makes to towns for state-owned buildings. And federally, there's federal pilot dollars as well, so there's the, you know, the federal forest. Um, but basically, the city of Montpelier um, is filled with a lot of state office buildings. I work in one of them, and it's a beautiful building, and I'm so glad to work in downtown Montpelier, so it's certainly not a complaint. Um, but it is not taxable. It's tax exempt because it's, it's a state-owned building. So the state, um, we work with um, the buildings and general services to calculate a payment in lieu of taxes that the state makes to each of the cities that have those. It's sort of a way to say, well, we're not paying taxes, but here's a payment in lieu of taxes because there's services that the city is providing by hosting these places. Um, but if you think about the concentration of state office buildings um, and other tax exempt you, businesses not -profits. and not nonprofits, and um, which are all what make Montpelier great, it also means there's the tax burden falls on those of us who own property and are not tax exempt. So um, it's it's a really tough balance because it part of what makes Montpelier great is that my kid can walk to the library and walk to the church and walk to school and walk to my office and 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 we have this great downtown. But the reality is you're dividing up that tax burden of like a city of 20,000 people among 8,000 of us. And so it's expensive. We need more houses and businesses here, I think. In terms of, of our schools, again, I'm going to walk you to, you didn't have a child in the school. What was the perception of the strength of the Montpelier school that you thought you would put a child in? Well, I had the advantage of working at the Agency of Education, and part of my job... So you were looking at the stat. ...was, a, was analyzing data all the time about different schools. And, and, you know, for better or for worse, there are rankings that come out about where schools place. And uh, Montpelier always did very well on, on all the standardized tests, um, AP and... Um, it was the kneecap, AP and now it's being um, a, a advanced placement courses. Kneecap being? Kneecap being um, the New England Common Assessment Program, which is now, I think kids now know it, it's the SBAC, the Standardized Boy, we've done Smarter so how balanced, many acronyms within Smarter a minute? Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. So they're the, they're, the, um, they're the federally required standardized tests. And what we do in Vermont, because we're small, is we partner up with neighboring states and other states to share in that test development so we're not paying quite as much, you know, so we share. I don't know who we're partnering with SBAC anymore because I haven't been following that as closely, but there's other states that use SBAC. Um, so I always would do, you know, we, we would do um, press releases annually about how Vermont students did and how Vermont schools did, and Montpelier was always, always did very well. Um, the thing is that if you start to look into the data deeper about Vermont and then Montpelier as a subset of Vermont, if you compare Vermont to like Iowa, or another state that is homogeneous, that is um, not particularly diverse and, and um, does not have any kind of urban hub or extreme rural to the state, you know, to the way that like Wyoming or Alaska does, we, we're, we're not as great as we always think we are. Vermont always says, you know, we've got the best whatever, but part of that is a result of our, our demographics. So we can't just sort of rest on our laurels and feel like we're doing well, for the large part, right. we're a well-educated community, mm -hmm. and a well-educated community that really prides itself. I think our our gather our, our civic gathering point is a library, is a public library. Mm -hmm. You know, where people take pride. People use that public library more, I suppose, than in, in many other communities across the country. Mm -hmm. Are we testing as well as we should, given the education of the parents and the like? Um, I don't know that I can ever say we're, we are or are not meeting a certain bar. Um, I, you would be on the, board, on the school board establishing expectations. Well, right. The superintendent and the principals of the schools are definitely more tightly aligned to the instructional leadership aspect. But, no, we would definitely be looking at data about how we're doing. I guess, I guess what I meant to say is more, um, while there's always room for improvement, I'm not... I'm not either. Um, I'm not either satisfied nor dissatisfied with our results. There. Where is there room for improvement, in your mind? Um, well, I think because we are small and limited in what we can offer, um, 
in our space and in our budget. I think we do not have as many um, mm -hmm. AP or other track advanced placement, advanced placement courses. Um, I think part of what made you know the federal No Child Left Behind, which has definitely you know had some very admirable points to it about making sure that we're we're meeting all students wherever they are, um, means that we're also not able to challenge some students as much as we would like, or challenge them as individuals as much as we would like. Um, we're all you know they're all still ushering through the same classroom. You know the classroom arrangement and the time of day and all that is just like it was a hundred years ago. You know school bell rings at 3 p.m. And instead of taking that extra time to, you know, offer some gifted and talented courses or offer a different whatever, you know, a lot of kids are wandering around to the library, don't hanging we, out outside. Don't we recognize that in our flexible pathways? Ideally, it's really hard to, um, you know, I was at the Agency of Education when we implemented the education quality standards that allowed for flexible pathways, and that is absolutely the goal. Um, it is very time intensive to do that. And could you explain what flexible pathways are? Sure. So, so essentially, um, you know, students can, uh, you know, within reason, be demonstrating their progress at certain subjects in their own time, whether it's they're doing a, a you know, an independent learning project or selecting a particular subject that they want to dig deeper into. Um, the idea being that they're building sort of their own portfolio and working at their own pace and studying things that they're engaged in and so they're demonstrating those proficiencies in you know, research, writing, exposition, um, presenting that are sort of those cross skills that are Aren't useful. Are those the proficiencies necessary for proficiency based <coughs> graduation? Yes. Yes. And I'm happy to say it seems like nationally that the, the proficiency-based graduation has not hindered kids' ability to get into college as much as there was, there was definitely that worry. That okay, now let's back up 10 seconds. What is proficiency-based uh, graduation and what is that requirement? Right, so, so essentially there's standards that all students have to meet, but then um, you basically are demonstrating how far along on the, this, the, the way to proficiency that you are. So if you can demonstrate your proficiency in these certain content areas and these certain skill sets, then you graduate with, um, you know, a, a basically a transcript that shows your proficiency-based performance for school so that then you can take that on to college and, or beyond. Um, <clears throat> the reality is it's, it's hard to do something like that when you're still using the same, you know, we're not getting more teachers, which would be great for exactly this sort of reason. Um, you know, the students are still learning how to drive their own learning to that way. I think depending on what school and what classroom you're in, it's more or less successful. We definitely hear in some schools in other parts of the state it's, it's not working very well or the students aren't getting what they need. Um, but Montpelier seems to be doing pretty well in that regard. There are some people <coughs> in the community who would say that our, our student-teacher ratio is really low and that compared to other states and that we should be producing more given that ratio is so low. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I think there's more to that data point than people might realize. Um, frankly, there's a lot of social and emotional behaviors that are in the classroom There are um, that take a lot of students' time and take a lot of the core teacher classroom time that is not able to be spent on instructional learning. Is that, is that behavioral concerns? Absolutely. Um, and it can be for lots of reasons. Um, you know, maybe the student's hungry or they're tired. You know, there's lots of things that happen outside of the classroom that the school has no, no, um, you know, no oversight over that impact a student's ability to learn and, and cooperate and participate in a traditional classroom. So. What schools have to do a lot of times is um, have instructional aides to come in and kind of help referee, but also help guide you know individual learning and help students get where they need to go. And so that takes staff. So um, I have not once in my time with my daughter in a Montpelier school felt like she had a small staff student ratio. She was always in a large classroom with one key instructional leader, and I wouldn't want less. So I think the student-staff ratio is taking into account a lot of staff members that are not the same as a core instructional educator. 
So it's not really telling the whole story. It's not like we have a classroom at the elementary middle school with 10 kids for one teacher. That's not, that's not what actually is happening in the room. Now, the unspoken thing that you were looking at when you were looking at educational data is the achievement gap between the children who are on subsidized and, and free lunches mm -hmm. and the rest of the class. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that started in 2019, 2018, 2017, but I believe that the board has said, we want to look at this and we want to address this and we want to close that gap. And uh, Libby and her team have been charged with putting together a plan that would accomplish that. You were looking at that data when you were working at the Department of Education, and you said, well, Montpelier comes out looking really good, but there's that other side where probably there are very few Vermont school districts that look very good in, in those terms. When you're right. casting light on that, that doesn't make the press releases. Right. What's the feeling on, when you were there in the state, what was the feeling on, on the gap? on the achievement gap? Yeah, it's um, it's certainly not unique to Montpelier or Vermont. I mean, this is a national issue. And, well, um, it's, it's no child left behind. Right, yeah. and, um, and so I think what was great about No Child Left Behind is that it forced us to talk about it and say it and, and record that and publicize that in a way that could have been easily brushed under the rug in past years. It, you, you have to look at your free and reduced lunch student performance your overall student performance, your male versus female student performance. And how many ethnic minorities we have. And for the towns in Vermont exactly. that have ethnic, you know, have, have the breakdown of, um, you know, by ethnicity, like all those breakdowns, you can't ignore what those statistics are telling you. And so, What are those statistics telling us? Um, there are advantages that are so um, subtle or taken for granted we don't even realize. So what here's, would those be? So here's a great example. So the other night um, we had a group of parents who went to meet the two finalists for the middle school principal. And, um, and I was one of those parents. And it was the same parents. We all have the ability, the time, the resources to take a t an hour out of our evening to weigh in on something like this. But if you're a family that you're working two jobs, or you have um, you aren't able to find childcare for your kids, so you can go and do that. Or you're um, you know you're working as a single parent trying to feed your. There's lots of those things that I think a lot of us take for granted in Montpelier. I was able to do that. I had my child was home. She was fed. She had another adult in the house who could help her with her homework, and I didn't have anything to lose by going and participating. But when you go to an event like that, it really sort of highlights the people who are not able to participate that way. And so the same thing happens with the students. So, um, you know, if a student is in the classroom and they have not, um, there's not someone who's able to be at home focused because they're working two or three jobs, which a lot of Vermonters are doing, um, or they, um, they're hungry, or they're tired, or they're cold, because you know, there's lots of those things that play out in how a student can learn and be ready to learn. Um, we also, you know, we pay for our child's athletic equipment and registration for camps. All of those things that enrich her experience and position her well to perform that a lot of us have in Montpelier, a lot of people don't. And the kids just continue to get left behind. Boy, doesn't that sound hopeless to you? That we're not <laughs> going to be able to change uh, the condition of how much they have. Of, you know, it just sounds like those, those kinds of barriers are beyond the ability of the school to change. Right. Well, so I think, uh, I think there are things that the school does do. I think it was great when um, Vermont decided that there wasn't going to be a reduced lunch price that they were going to provide free lunch for students. Um, I think that so that, the pejorative is taken away. Yes, yes, it's not. You know, there's not a ticket that you have to take that says you're reduced versus free or whatever. Um, I think our schools do a phenomenal job of trying not to have kids have to pay for any of their supplies. Um, there always seem to be at least a lot of the camps and trainings around here. There always seem to be scholarships available. And I think also, um, especially at the middle school, obviously I'm focused on that because I have a child there, but um, they have a lot of really good enrichment for after school. 
And that's really key because that window of time between 3 and 5 p.m. when um, kids are unsupervised or they're not, you know, they may not be eating a very healthy snack or they may not have anyone helping them with their homework or they may be, you know, out and about and catching a cold. That period of time just nationally is not just Vermont, but like that period of time is a really dangerous time for kids that age and it's where they can lose a lot of important growth. And so I think the middle school has done a really good job of of having lots of opportunities, including just having the library open for that period of time. No cost, you don't have to sign up or commit. You can go and do your homework or read a book or get some help. And it's just, it's, it's a resource to the kids. Those little things do help. And those do matter and they do make a difference, I think. Well, something else that makes a difference are parents volunteering in the schools and the, the community stepping up for the schools, and I'm thinking particularly of Matt McLean's um, um, community-based learning mm -hmm. and the number of sites around the city that do step forward to take high school students in. That's strength. Absolutely, and, and that's, those connections will help those students forever. They will have that experience, they will have that connection. They may use that as a reference for a job down the road. I mean, those, that, that connection and that experience opens doors in a way that it's, it's, such a smart, it's such a smart solution, it really is. We're a white middle class community. Do you feel that the children who are ethnically different have a challenge blending in to this community? Um, I'm not one, so I don't know, but I have to believe that, um, that this is Vermont in general, especially like I said, growing up in the Northeast Kingdom, um, that there are things that a lot of us just assume and assume that we're doing right or assume that we're being sensitive about that we are not. Um, and so I can imagine that that would be really challenging. I think Montpelier overall is a really good community and I feel like even just since when I was in high school versus now that my daughter's getting into that age, um, the acceptance and the support of um, marginalized groups that was non-existent when, when I was even in high school, which was, you know, 25 years ago. What would a marginalized group be? So here's an example. So um, we have we have um, gender neutral bathrooms all over Vermont now. Not a thing. My, it's just a normal part of their school day. When I was in high school, uh, two girls were not allowed to dance together. It was considered completely inappropriate. And this, this was really sort of highlighted for me when I was watching a movie with my daughter and they, they said the first rule of this dance, no same-sex couples. And that was sort of how it was when we were kids. And she was like, wait, that was, that was actually a thing? Because to her, they've grown up with a much better perspective on, um, on all aspects of just individuality that, that we, were just, we just took for granted, we didn't know any different. Um, where I grew up, the, the, the real um, disparities were with folks who were in poverty versus not. You know, there's a huge amount of poverty in the kingdom, and so there was definitely stigmas attached to that. Is there a stigma attached, do you think, coming in from Roxbury to Montpelier? Oh, I don't know about that. There's so few kids, too. Well, I, I agree, but... <laughs> um, you know, I didn't really think of it that way. I, I remember when we were first early on having those conversations, and... And, um, you know, I just was, again, counting my stars that the house we happened to buy is above the middle school, which was not our intention when we bought the house, that that's a long way to, to drive to go to school. But the folks in Roxbury were saying, well, we, we choose to live here. We know that it's a hall, and that's part of why we choose to live here. We're okay with that. And so it just became sort of a non-issue. Um, and no, I think, it's, I think it's been a great arrangement. I think it's always good to boost our enrollment, and I think it's always good for those kids to be able to be in a bigger group where they can have more art, um, after school, sports, you know, all, anytime you have a um, consolidation of students, you get more opportunities. We also get inefficiency. I mean, that, that school is extremely small, mm -hmm. has 30 or 40 students in it, and it has to be staffed it will exist for a certain period of time. That mm -hmm. was written into the contract. Mm -hmm. But after that, its fate is open. What's your mm -hmm. thought on that? I would definitely like to hear more from the other Roxbury board members to hear how they're experiencing it. I think um, the idea that those younger grades really should be 
local, especially pre-K, kindergarten, one, two, um, I think there's definitely value in continuing to have some sort of a community school for that age group, absolutely. Um, so I'm not, I'm not able to really say that I have a position one way or the other about it right now, but I think it was a smart move to, um, to move our middle and high school kids here, and I think it was a smart move to, um, to beef up the early, early grades there because pre-K is so incredibly important to set them on the right path. And if they have that opportunity, then let's do that. But there definitely could be ways we could use the buildings differently. Um, but that's part of why I want to get on the board and hear what, what the plans are and hear what Roxbury folks have to say about it. In terms of, of exclu inclusivity, what do you say to the religious conservatives who feel like the schools are moving more and more away from their core values? I don't think a religious constituency has a say in how a public school should be organized. No, but they do have a say in terms of how their child, you know, views the world, how the world inside that school views their child. I, as, as someone who grew up here and now has a child in the system, I am so proud of how far we have come as a society. And I, I don't see the harm in being erring on the side of inclusive and I'm I'm really like I said I'm impressed that that's just sort of part of our kids lexicon now they don't even they don't think anything of saying what pronoun they are or that's just part of how they and it's really um, it really makes me proud to be in a community that 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 values that and it's so much a part of who we are and school is where you know school is still really tough for a lot of kids, um, and nobody's ever going to be happy with everything that happens Tough in school. Tough in what way for a lot of kids? Um, on a daily basis, they're dealing with uh, hormones, friendship issues. Um, Sounds like you're describing the middle school. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, there's a great deal on, on high school students that you're supposed to somehow figure out what you're going to do with the rest of your life by the time you're applying to college when you're 17, 18 years old. That's a huge amount of pressure. Um, you know, in elementary school, there's so many things that kids are dealing with. There's, there's health, there's family, there's, um, you know, there's how you feel about how you're doing on your standardized test. You know, there's, there's lots of... Now, that's in real world. That's not the cyber world pressures. No, right. Not even taking into account, you know. I, I do think there's a sort of a malaise in general in our society dealing with um, you know, social media and the news these days that is definitely impacting our kids too. It's just, it's, it's, I don't think middle school or high school is ever going to be easy for anybody. <laughs> Maybe for a few, but. How do you see the role of the board evolving? So I think it's really important that a board know what is and is not their purview. So when I was at Agency of Education, you know, we worked with school boards, superintendents, principals on a daily basis. I think it's really important that our role is to um, to model the best practices and to support the administration and the schools in carrying out their long-term plans um, and also being a sounding board and a way to connect with the community. But it is not appropriate for a school board member to, um, to micromanage in any way the instructional practices at a particular school or to um, or to um, you know go over the superintendent's head when advocating for something. I mean, the whole idea is that we are a board of community members who are a sounding board and also uh, responsible for balancing the needs of every taxpayer in Vermont with the needs of the school and articulating that in both directions. But you're also informal ombudsman. Yeah. <laughs> that's yes, the I've been told that, that I need to reality. plan on getting a lot of. Uh, emails and stopped on the street, um, you know, questions and opinions. And, and I was one of those people who did that as a parent, so I, I get it. Um, and I do think that our board has been pretty good about um, hearing folks out. Sometimes you just need to have somebody hear you out so that the administration or the principal or the school board can hear what the, what's happening at the school, how that's actually, you know, impacting. Jill, I want to thank you so very much for thank being for with me, me tonight. Thank you. This and I fun. want to thank you guys for watching this show. And as I said at the beginning, and I'll say at the end, um, watch the other shows.
They're, they're all really, really good. All of the candidates are good. Watch Libby's show on the school budget and watch the show uh, that Bill has on the city budget. But one more thing, make sure that you get out and vote on town meeting day. And I know you're thinking, well, all these people are running unopposed, but get out there and vote on these budgets because voting on town meeting day is our collective responsibility and our collective democracy. Thank you very much for your time.